Hi everybody, I'm Michael. Today we're gonna to be talking about the Swiss cheese plant and how you can best grow her in your home or in your garden outside down here in South Florida. So, you ready to dig in? Let's grow. The Swiss cheese plant goes by the botanical name Monstera deliciosa. And this big girl is native to the rainforests of Central America. Such a beauty. I learned this name and plant ID with a friend of mine from college, Kelly, and she told me to memorize the botanical name uh, as like a monster eating these delicious leaves. And that's where that's how I was always able to remember this plant's botanical name, Monstera deliciosa, because it's the monster found the leaves so delicious it started to eat through them. And I've never forgot that since my college days on how to remember this plant. The, the one cool thing about this plant, speaking of the, the species Deliciosa, the fruit of this plant is edible when it's ripe. Let me make, make, make that point again. When it's ripe, it is a wonderful tasting fruit that has like a banana strawberry, I'm sorry, banana and, and uh, pineapple. There is some hints of strawberry, but it's, it's, it's almost like little pieces of corn. But you gotta be careful because there are other plants that have similar cone-like fruits that are not edible. And again, this plant, when the, when the uh, fruit is not ripe, it is not edible and it can cause some irrit irritation to your lips. So, so you gotta make sure that the, the fruit had opened and then you'll get to the white fleshy piece underneath and you can eat it. So that's a cool little thing about this plant. This plant can be confused and has been confused with the Little Swiss which goes by the botanical name Monstera adansonii, but it's a much smaller plant and the leaves are much smaller than, than this girl here. But they're both, they're both make great house plants. It's, it's a stunner. It's definitely a plant where you need to have some room. So you're gonna get three by three easily, easily indoors and can grow if you have a totem or you wanna, you wanna uh, have her kind of climb up on herself with a stake. She can easily get up to about five feet indoors if you put her in the right location. And we'll talk about plant care in a minute, so, so stay tuned. One thing I want to mention about this plant is that she can grow indoors or outdoors. So we're going to talk about growing her indoors, and in a minute we're going to switch over and I'll talk to you about how you can use this plant to grow, to grow her outdoors. She, she, is, she is just a beauty. New leaves will come out in this wonderful, wonderful lime green color. You can see it on some of them already over here. We'll zoom in so you can see this is newer leaves that just came out. She just unfurled the last day or so. So pretty! But new leaves, when you say you're getting a small one, if you get one in a six inch container, it may look like the Hartley philodendron. It may only have a leaf, leaves looking like this. This is normal. This is what the plant will, sh will shoot out when she's just starting to grow. And as these things just yellow and die off, new growth is gonna start having, all the new growth coming out from above here is gonna have all these fenestrations. But new growth will start out with just like a little heart-shaped leaf and then it continues to keep growing and then starts to break out these little openings inside the leaves, which are so exotic, so, so pretty. She is a wonderful, wonderful houseplant. You just have to give her room. I'm, I'm struggling between her and our ruby ficus over our ruby uh, ficus rubber plant on which one I love, but I think, which one I love more, but I think Swiss cheese. She's just, she's just crazy beautiful. Oh, such a pretty plant. So exotic. There's a version of this plant, a variety called Thai Constellation, and I believe it's patented from from a lab over there in Thailand. It's very expensive and hard to come by, but it's it's a very very pretty pretty monstera. I love that plant, but I just don't I just don't think it's worth the price to pay pay a steep dollar for for a small plant, but it's so pretty. This is, oh, I just love variegated plants, like, you know, like our, our Taniki here. So on, on the plant, with, with her growth habit, you're gonna have either a, an upright plant if you put her on a totem, but if you don't, she's gonna try to sprawl and spread outward. So you gotta make sure you give her plenty of room. And we'll talk about plant care in a minute, and we'll also be giving you written care instructions on all this, so you get an idea, and you can always take a screenshot if you want, so you can, you can look to uh, care for your beautiful Monstera. Oh, the Swiss cheese is so pretty. So, 
Let me talk a little bit now about growing her outdoors. The Swiss cheese plant will grow well down here outdoors in zones 10 and 11, but you can also grow her in zones 9B, but probably coastal 9B because the Swiss cheese plant is not cold tolerant. Um, I designed a lot in, in the firm I worked at in the late 80s, and early 90s, did a lot of these plantings at Weston, and we had these in planters where on the north side of a home because they can grow up and over and they form a real wonderful, wonderful, lush, tropical look. So exotic. Does not want to get full sun. Can can start outdoors over time, acclimate to it, but the leaves will get a little bit more, more uh, yellow. They won't be as, as bright green or even get this nice dark green over time. So you've got to be you got to be strategic on where you place these. You want to make sure it's near or under a grove of palms or, or a big tree because that's where that's where these guys do best. They grow, like I mentioned, in the rainforest down there in Central America, and they're getting that dappled sunlight. But it will grow probably probably more like four by four outdoors. They can kind of climb. They have these roots, these aerial roots that that will start to, to support the plant and also latch onto things so they can kind of climb a little bit. They're not, they're not super, they're more clumsy growers, I would say, than some other plants that hook onto uh, uh, tree bark and palms to uh, climb up the edges of them. But such a great plant down here in South Florida. So, so pretty. Now, with that, let me see. On spacing, let me talk a little bit more about that outdoors. On spacing, I used to space these about three to four feet on center. You can't space them closer, but you, you, these things get quite big, but some people want more of an instant look, so you can space them about three feet apart. And you want to provide them with, um, with some good, good well-drained soil. So. On plant care, let's first talk about growing your Swiss cheese plant indoors. She's going to want high light and that's going to be between 800 and 1,000 foot candles. That means putting her near a west-facing window but not direct sunlight because we did that and we scorched some of our leaves. I'm so sorry. So that's, we'll zoom in so you can see that up close. Uh, when you see this bleaching look on the leaves, you know that you, you, you put her too close to the light. And luckily this new leaf coming out over here unfurled afterwards because she would have been she would have been all burned but luckily she still hadn't pulled out or, her, or unfurled yet uh, but that's that's a problem if you if you plant, place your plant too close to where sunlight cuts in and in the corner she was uh, getting that that afternoon 4 30 sunlight I think it was around that time for, for about a week or so and I'm like ah didn't realize so so sorry so back to Back to the plant care. So highlight, again, 800 to 1,000 foot candles. So that means you want a lot of bright light. This is where the plant will do best and start to put out a lot of new growth. You can go to medium light, 500 foot candles or lower, and she'll just sort of hang out and do her thing. But it's better, best to give her, give her between 800 and 1,000 foot candles for her to do her optimum growth. Now on soil, she wants a well-drained mix, but she wants some organics in it, and we like this potting mix. 80% indoor potting mix, this ratio, sorry. 80% indoor potting mix, 10% perlite, 5% orchid uh, mix, and 5% worm castings. And mix that all together, and you're gonna form this well-drained loamy mix, because this plant, being, being growing down there in the rainforest, wants to, wants to drain pretty well, but also wants some of those organics. And that's gonna that's gonna do your plant very well. Now, when the plant fills out the pot, you'll start to see the roots sh sh shooting out. These little supporting buttressing roots will uh, start to push out, and you'll see a lot of roots start to get on the top of the plant. And that may start to tell you that you, you don't want to have circling roots. That can be a problem. Not necessarily more for plants indoors, but definitely if you have plants that you're placing outdoors, you don't want circling roots. So you probably want to up up pot your plant once you start to see a lot of crowded roots. And sometimes, if ours is grown in a plastic container, and sometimes you'll see them actually deform the shape of the container, then you know, then you know your Swiss cheese needs to be potted up. But it's such a pretty plant, I can't say it enough. So, on watering now, indoors, you want to water every seven to nine days. 
and she's gonna do fine, but you wanna water well too. You wanna water so that the water drains out. You still wanna water a little bit on the top. You wanna to make sure that the water drains through. But if you come back in the seven or nine day period and you test it with your finger two inches down, you still feel that it's very damp, or you can use a bamboo skewer and drive it down there a few inches, and if you pull it back and there's a lot of moisture or dirt on the bamboo skewer, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be able to hold off on the watering. You, your plant will kind of tell you, your, your Swiss cheese will tell you if you're overwatering or underwatering, she'll tend to wilt. So it's either one or the other. So if you notice your plant is very, very dry and starting to wilt, then you know you haven't watered enough. But if your plant is also wilting and, and you have a, you touch the soil and it's very, very damp, and then, then you know that you overwatered and you definitely need to, to uh, pull back. It's safer to underwater than to overwater, for sure, because Root rot is a terrible thing to deal with. A very, very bad thing to deal with. Oh. Now, on fertilizer, we use a 20-20-20 from April through September, but in May, we add in a 19-6-12 slow release because these are kind of a little bit more heavy of a feeder plant, feed, uh, heavy feeder. She wants, she wants a little bit more nutrition, so that slow release helps, we found helps the plant, and you can pick that stuff up on Amazon. But you wanna have, you wanna hire nitrogen to help with the greening. So, so cool. Now, one thing that this plant, on pests, this plant can get aphids, mealybugs, thrips, but we haven't had a problem um, years ago, years ago, um, not this plant, I think mealybugs was, was the, was the, was the problem, but but you can control that with insecticidal soap, or you can wash it down with with um, um, alcohol on a swab and touch touch wherever you see the mealybugs. But it mostly is it's a pretty hardy plant. You're not going to necessarily have that problem unless unless uh, you have a bad infestation nearby. Now I kind of skipped over. I want to talk about humidity. This plant wants north of 50 percent. Homes are going to have around 40 percent, so it's not ideal it won't hurt the plant but you can always put leca which is what we do in ours we put leca in the bottom of our container the outer container and, when, and that that, well, that excess water that pours out when you when you water your plant will be absorbed by the leca and then slowly evaporate and, and provide some more humidity you can also add this plant to your other plants and they share the humidity among themselves and they do pretty well so because she's a tropical plant she wants she wants a higher humidity. You could also use a pebble tray. Some people uh, have done that to, to do it, but it's not 100% necessary to do that. It, it, you want your plants to do as best as they can, so it doesn't hurt. I just like doing the leca down here because it's kind of all, all hidden and it's all, all, in the, all inside the, the uh, outer container. So with that, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about growing or plant care for, for the Monstera Deliciosa outdoors. So if you're going to be planting this down here in coastal 9B or 10 or 11, you're going to want to have her placed in an area where she's getting dappled sunlight, not direct sunlight because again, she'll, she'll burn. She'll get these little burns here and it's a shame. She won't die, but she's gonna look not look good. Um, these can adapt to grow towards getting some afternoon sun over time. But it's best that this plant will do best growing under some trees or a grove of, of palms or a grouping of palms overhead or a home, a tall home next to the side and north side of a home, uh, and east side of a home. West side of the home is gonna be tougher for this plant to grow outdoors. In Weston, we always, when I worked at a, a firm many, many, many moons ago, in the 90s or late 80s and 90s. Uh, we plant a lot of these at Limo Ranch Estates and they have these wonderful spec homes that had these raised planters and on the north side. This would be a good plant that we, when we were planting other palms nearby and some trees. This is a great plant to, to have in a planter because she can kind of grow up and over. She'll do this. She's a clumsy vine-like grower. She doesn't necessarily grow like a, a true vine but she does have these, these aerial roots that come out that are so, so pretty and that kind of help the plant kind of move around and, and, and over time can cascade over a, a large uh, planter wall, which makes her so, so, so cool to look at. And again, I mean, if you want a tropical plant, I mean, I mean this, the tiniki, this is, this is one for sure. 
just, just love her. So on, I keep talking about the plant characteristics. Sorry, I just, uh, when I see these plants, they're so cute. The watering outdoors, you want to do it typically three times a week if you have an um, automatic irrigation system. And you want a loamy soil, so similar to the indoor potting mix, you don't have to do it to that exact ratio. You just want, you just want a uh, well-drained, but, but you want to add some, some organics out there. So you could, you could add worm castings, which we, which we absolutely love. Mix in with some outdoor potting mix. And if it's sandy soil, then you really don't need to add perlite. But if you're in a mucky condition, you're gonna to wanna to add some perlite in there to uh, allow for drainage uh, in the soil. So there's some air, air movement because the roots need to breathe. So now that I've done that, I think I've touched base with you all on all the plant care. But what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna rotate over in the written care instructions and go, with, go into more detail with all this so you can take a screenshot if you'd like and, and uh, have it for, for your plant care needs and then we'll come back and do a quick summary at the end. All right, let's go on to that step. We want to thank you for stopping by, but if you have any thoughts or questions, just leave them in the comment section below and I'll make sure I get back to you. And until the next video, bye. Please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And tell your friends and family, we post videos weekly. Thanks.